Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this time of worship. Whoever you are and wherever you are this morning, you are a beloved child of God. You are welcome in the presence of God and you are welcome to worship with us. We are scattered all across our region, maybe all across the world, but right now we remember that we are gathered together in God's spirit, that we are holding one another in prayer, that we are the body of Christ together, and that we are not alone. God is with us. We've come together to worship and we are still thinking about what it means to be the body of Christ when we are in this time of forced separation. And we're talking about the things that we promise to do when we join each other as a congregation. There's five specific things we promise to do to support each other with our prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. Today, we're talking about gifts, which can be a very tricky one, but also can be um, a real opportunity for blessing and joy. I have a centering thought this morning for us. It's from Henry Nowen, and he writes, God will make our love fruitful, whether we see that fruitfulness or not. God will make our love fruitful, whether we see that fruitfulness or not. Maybe this is a time where it's hard to see the fruitfulness, or maybe this is a time where it's easier than usual to see the fruitfulness of our love, to see how important it is to see the effects of it. I like this reminder that uh, every act of love is not wasted, but it, it bears fruit and it bears more love. It proclaims God's love to all the world. So it reminds us to keep the faith and keep going, to keep reaching out in love because every act of love is valuable. I'm so glad we're here to worship together. We have some wonderful music to share this morning. So let's worship and sing together. One, two, three, ready and up. Morning has broken like the first morning. Blackbird has spoken like the first bird. Praise for the singing. Praise for the for them springing fresh from the world. Sweet the rain's new fall, sunlit from heaven, like the first dew fall on the first grass. Praise for the sweetness of the wet God. Sprung in completeness where his feet pass. Mine is the sunlight, mine is the morning. Born of the one light, Eden soft lay. Praise with elation, praise every morning. God's recreation of the new day. Our scripture this morning comes from the book of 2 Corinthians. Just as a reminder, Corinthians is written by Paul, who's a traveling pastor, and he started and led churches all across his region. And they were small churches. The church in Corinth probably only had 50 people or so. And Paul wrote them several letters over the course of his relationship, which they saved and we compiled and we have in two books, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. There are probably some letters that got lost along the way, uh, but what we have tells us the story of the church's relationship with itself and its relationship with Paul. So we know that the church was not a smooth ride there was a lot of uh, friction in the congregation between different demographics and types of people. They had issues about who they should include and who they should not include and how they should live together in their life as a congregation. 
So the a study of 1st and 2nd Corinthians is always very interesting. Uh, in this passage today, Paul is talking about why we give to one another. And uh, he uses some metaphors, like an agriculture metaphor, that God is the one who gives the seed, and so the harvest belongs to God. And he also reminds them that um, they are recipients of a great bounty. There's an abundance of blessing from God. So it's a good and uh, cheerful and hopeful message for us as well. Um, and Carolyn Almond is here to read that scripture for us. Our scripture today is 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 15. The point is this. The one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and the one who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each of you must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance, so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. As it is written, he scatters abroad, he gives to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest for your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way for your great generosity which will produce thanksgiving to God through us. For the rendering of this ministry may not only, not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also overflows with many thanksgivings to God. Through the testing of this ministry, you glorify God by your obedience to the confession of the gospel of Christ, by the generosity of your sharing with them and with all others. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Friends, you might remember that last week I said that each of these uh, five things um, that we do, prayers, presence, gifts, service, witness, uh, each of them is a blessing from God, but they also have kind of their shadow side. Um, there's a way to see them cynically where it feels like they're cheap things. And I think gifts is the one where it's the easiest to be cynical about because um, supporting a church or a congregation or the ministry of God with your gifts is such a blessing that's easy to abuse. And no doubt all of us can point to a time or a person or a church that has abused the gifts of the people. We can probably think of stories of of mega churches that just seem to be rolling in wealth or stories of pastors taking private jets around the country or owning multiple million dollar mansions. Um, I even know of a, a social media account called Preachers in Sneakers. And when it started, people thought it was kind of a parody account because it would, it would highlight these mega church famous preachers who were wearing designer tennis shoes that cost over thousands of dollars. I mean, some, you know, five, six, seven thousand dollar tennis shoes. Um, it turns out the guy who started it, it wasn't a parody account. He wasn't doing it to show the hypocrisy of these pastors, but kind of as a way to say, look, aren't these guys cool? Because they have these latest uh, Dior sneakers or a Gucci belt or, you know, some kind of designer leather jacket. So that does not look good to the outside world, right? Where we're preaching um, service, uh, giving love away, giving good news to the poor. It doesn't, it doesn't fit. It's hypocritical to, to be celebrating wealth when our savior lifted up the poor and the marginalized. So it's really easy to be hypocrites when it talks to how, when it comes to how we talk about money and what we do with our money. And that means it's really difficult for us to talk about this subject. It's difficult to talk about money, period, regardless, because it's so personal. It is such a personal thing. 
But then when we have so many examples of churches that have abused the trust that comes when people give their money, uh, it can be something where we just we don't want to talk about it at all. We don't want to be seen as those pastors asking vulnerable people for money to line our pockets and make our lives luxurious. Uh, but if we just don't talk about it at all, then that's like throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Then we actually do miss the, the blessing that, that God has given to us when it comes to living our life in community and sharing freely with one another. So I just want you to know that that's in my mind when we have these kinds of conversations. I'm, I'm very aware of um, not wanting to be seen as the, the pastors who are abusing people's trust and abusing people's gifts made in good faith. Um, but we we do want to talk about it so that we can, because I do think there is blessing, there is joy and new life to be found in sharing what we have with one another. So I'm going to try to ride the fence between not, uh, you know, setting out to buy uh, my next multiple million dollar mansion <laughs> and, and just not talking about this at all. We're also talking about how we do these, these five membership promises in an age of coronavirus when we're separated and how it's made us rethink how we do these things. And I don't know about for you, but for me, I've really rethought what it means to give to one another. You know, when the, the offering plate's not just coming by automatically every Sunday morning at 1035 or whatever it is, and you just give out of routine. Or in our case, we have it set up to come out of our bank account. You know, we get paid the first of the month, and so the, the check to the church comes out on like the third or something. And I literally do not think about it because I don't even have to do anything. It just automatically goes to the church. Uh, it's good to actually stop and think about <laughs> what it means to give. And obviously, this is a time where we've had to stop and think about everything because we have no uh, none of our normal routines. So that's the, the context for this conversation. Um, we've all heard that the cliche or the phrase, what's mine is yours, right? Um, that is certainly true in a pandemic, or it's it. we see truths to that in a different way during a pandemic. What's mine is yours. We are all connected. The very air I breathe becomes the air you breathe which is part of the problem of this pandemic, right? That's why we have to, to wear our masks so that my, my breath stays with me and doesn't go to you. Um, the pandemic just shows us how interconnected we all are. I remember the last sermon I gave in person here uh, before we, we shut down. Oh gosh, look, that gives me goosebumps to remember, <laughs> to remember this memory. Um, I had gone out to dinner with some friends and uh, this was like March uh, 6th, or I think. Uh, it was a Friday night, whatever that Friday in March was. And it was, it was in that like one or two week period where we were all talking about it and there was a lot of news about it, but nothing had been shut down yet. So the, the news was about wash your hands, you know, just wash your hands all the time and like don't shake hands, you know, do the, do the elbow bump. And um, so I got to the restaurant, met my friends, said, I'm gonna go to the restroom. I washed my hands super, super well, came back down, took a drink of water, put it back down. The bus boy was going around the restaurant, filling up glasses, and he came over and filled up mine and put it back down. And I realized I had just washed my hands, but now the bus boy had touched my glass after he had touched everyone in the restaurant's glass. And I'm like, What's the point of washing my hands now? Because I've got a little bit of everybody on me. And I thought, how do we extricate ourselves from this kind of community? We're so connected in ways that we, we don't even see because our habits just kind of blind us to, to how much we interact with others. We've certainly seen that over the course of the pandemic, right? Where, um, you know, sometimes we think, oh, well, we're so, we're different than them. But there's a great example of um, if there is a coronavirus outbreak in the, the migrant worker community and those children go to school, 
Well, then the teachers get sick and the teachers go home and get their families sick. And suddenly these communities are not that separate at all. They're, they're really connected. Not to give you another scary story, but I'm sure you're reading about the vaccines and, and the rollout and how it's going. And we're, maybe we're thinking very locally about our own home here in Clark County. But I read an article about the global vaccine rollout and how important it is for developing countries to be vaccinated as well, and not just the wealthy countries who can kind of bid on the open market and get all the vaccine the first time around. Because the longer the virus goes, the more time it has to mutate and change. And if not all the world is vaccinated, that gives the virus more time to mutate in other countries, which will eventually come to our country as well. So it's in our best interest to not just vaccinate ourselves or fight for ourselves to get the vaccine, but for everyone to have it. It just is kind of mind boggling to think how connected we are on a global scale, not just the busboy filling up my water glass and touching all the glasses in one little restaurant, but uh, what happens in South Africa or Brazil eventually affects me here in Ridgefield, Washington. What's mine is yours. Now, we've kind of, I've <laughs> told you stories about how this works in a negative way, but, but the story we have in Corinthians today reminds us that God actually uses this connection in a positive way. Because when we think about what's mine is yours and what yours, what's yours is mine, that actually means we have enough of everything we need. God has, has given us everything we need. We have plenty. It doesn't feel that way right now. It might feel like we are at a time of scarcity, but even still, there's an abundance there of, uh, of love, of time, of patience, of money, of joy, of fulfillment, right? We have what we need because we are able to share it with one another. Money um, is a very real thing. I mean, it buys real food that feels, fills up real tummies. It buys real shelter that keeps out the real cold. So money is real, but money is also a symbol. I mean, and that's why it's, it's so difficult to talk about because money is a symbol for that which is most personal to us. It's what we have. In some ways, it might even be more um, personal than our time, which is, uh, which is odd because our time is probably our most limited resource. But if you think about, at least I think about asking people to give something to the church, it's much easier for me to ask people to give their time than it is for me to ask people to give their money. And I think, I don't know, it might be easier for people to give their time because it's easy to come to church and put up some Christmas lights or mow the grass or spread some gravel or scrub some toilets uh, because you can see the effect of that. Usually you get to do it with other people. It makes you feel good that you're, you're giving to your church. But to give money, well, that's uh, somehow that's just a little bit different, right? Um, it's so personal. But that means when we give money to the church, that's an extremely personal gift. So again, there's always the shadow side, right? It's like, uh, it's, ooh, it's so personal. I'm not sure we should talk about it. But when we give something so personal, that's a way of really binding us together. It's a way of saying, what's mine is yours. And I care about you, congregation, so much that I'm gonna give you this, my most precious resource. I'm gonna share that with you uh, because you deserve it, because you need it, because I want you to have it, because I want us to recognize that it's all, we have, it's all here. The abundance is all here together. God has given us an abundance that we recognize in community. We're able to receive it in community and live it out in community. Uh, Paul uses a, an agricultural metaphor, and I think it might even be easier for us to see this in an agricultural environment or an agricultural society agrarian society, right? So he talks about um, you reap what you sow 
and the the sower gets the seeds from God. So like the 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 act of uh, planting is is God's act, and gathering in the harvest then is God's act as well. Now I'm not a farmer. <laughs> I'm a couple generations removed. I think my grandfather was a farmer, but uh, like most Americans, I'm a couple generations removed now from that agrarian society. So I have to use my imagination. But uh, I've planted things on a very small scale before, and I can think about like, I can pick out the seeds, I can put them in the ground and make the conditions right. Although I can't usually make the conditions right, and not a green thumb, but I could try. And in theory, I could make the conditions right for those seeds to always grow. But I cannot actually make the seed grow. That there is some kind of magic there. Although it's not really magic, is it? We might call it science, <laughs> or we might also say it's just uh, the spirit of life that makes life continue to grow. If you give it all the right conditions, it changes, that seed changes into something you can eat or make bread out of, feed the world, or it becomes a tree that provides life for critters, for us, changing carbon dioxide into oxygen that we can breathe. There is some kind of spirit at work when things grow. And we can do everything we can, but we can't make that seed become the wheat or become the oak tree. It's the spirit of life that's present in there. And so if you can imagine yourself in an agrarian society, you're a farmer, you can do all of this very intense work, but there's the spirit that has to be at work too. Then it's not too much of a leap to, see it, to, to think that the spirit is the one who provides this abundance. I've done the work, I have done the hard, hard work, but I couldn't get there without the spirit making all of this grow, without the spirit um, providing this harvest for me to gather in. If you are in a society where everybody's income works that way, then maybe it's easier to see that God really is at work in providing what we have. If we can carry that metaphor into, into our culture, where maybe we go to an office, or these days we go to our little home office, or we go to our job and we do our labor and someone at the end of the pay period gives us a paycheck. Is there a way that we can use that agrarian model uh, metaphor to see that there's the spirit at work in our labor too? And what we have is ultimately a gift from God. What we have still, even as removed as we are from that agrarian society, what we have is still a product of the bounty of creation. Even still, with all of our developments and all our removal from the agrarian society, the food we eat has to come from the earth somehow, some way, somewhere in the, in the channel. So what we have is a sign of God's abundance. It might be a little bit harder for us modern folks to remember that or to see it, but uh, what we have is a product of the spirit. And when we share that with one another, it's a way of kind of reconnecting us to that, that truth that we're all connected. When we make a gift to our church, when we make a gift to one another, when we write that check or set up our online bill pay, uh, when we're able to put money in the offering plate when we're back together, it's a reminder, it's a symbol of, of that truth, that reality that the spirit is alive in our community and the spirit is what provides this abundance, provides this life for one another. If we go back to just the, the prayer thing that we do together, it can be easier to see this connection because I know we feel that connection when we pray for one another. When someone we love has to be rushed to the ER, doesn't a piece of our heart go with them? And we, we get that prayer through our email or through a phone call and we, oh, our heart is there with that person. We are connected. And if we, could, if we could be there with them, we would. If we could do anything to remove that burden from them, we would. That connection's easier to feel. 
it's easy to feel that connection when we have a joy, when we have an accomplishment, a graduation, a big anniversary, when health is regained. Aren't we connected with that person? Don't we just feel so much lighter? And sometimes we'll even say like, thank you so much for sharing. This is just the joy I needed today, right? Like. We can see this in our prayer, that we're connected and that the, the burden and the fear of one affects all of our hearts and the joy and celebration of one affects all of our hearts. So we can see in our prayers how connected we are. We, we've got to regain the blessing, the, the same connection um, of giving monetary gifts to one another because it is the same. It's that same principle. It's that reminder that we are connected. And when we reclaim this idea or remember this idea that we're all connected, what we see is, gosh, we really have enough. We really are blessed by God. God is here with us. I know we can feel this in our prayer time sometimes when, when we just have these burdens to lift up or these joys that make us laugh. Um, and we, we remember that God is in our midst, it, we can see, okay, this is awful, but we can get through it together. This is unbearable, and yet God has not abandoned us. We will get through this together. It's the same thing with our monetary gifts. We are in a world of scarcity, but actually God has given us an abundance and we can get through it together. We can celebrate and receive that abundance together, but only together. This is the really tricky part about uh, gifts, is that there is plenty in our world, but only if we share it. This is what Paul's message is in the Corinthians. You actually have enough. God has given you an abundance between us. It's not just for you alone. What's mine is yours and what's yours is mine. And in that connection, we have an abundance. This is such a helpful and needed message for us right now because this is actually a time of scarcity. Maybe more a time of scarcity than any, any one of us have lived through in, in our generations. Maybe not since like the, the depression era have we known a time of scarcity. Uh, we certainly know there's not enough vaccine yet we know it's coming, but it gets harder and harder to wait every week when we see that some people have gotten it and some are still waiting. And there's not really a clear uh, a designation between who gets it first and who has to wait a little bit longer. So we feel that shortage of the vaccine. We feel a shortage of income or a shortage of economy where some industries have been decimated and some are actually soaring. And we feel that, that um, unevenness and we worry about people in both extremes. Um, there's a shortage of uh, patience and time, a shortage of um, uh, boundaries. <laughs> For some people who are used to having time to get their work done or time to themselves, uh, suddenly, they're at home with their family all the time. There's a shortage of, uh, th there's the opposite shortage, right, of interaction and community. And some people who are used to having time with friends, kids are used to going out to recess, uh, ladies are used to going out to lunch, men are used to hanging out. I mean, we're all used to our society, our, our company that we keep. And now there's a shortage of that too. We feel this shortage in our spirits. And we talk about hitting the COVID wall. You know, boy, I've been, I've been bumping up against that wall a lot lately. Just kind of like, oh, I'm so tired of trying to come up with one more idea, you know? Um, so it really feels like on many fronts, this is a time of shortage. And yet, God is still with us. And then we hear stories about how people, when they share, they realize there's an abundance to get them through this time of shortage. There's a good news story uh, this week, maybe you heard this story, from Southern Oregon. I think it's Josephine County. Um, my parents live uh, in Ashland, 
and they were able to get their vaccine this week in Josephine County, just to the north of where they live. And, um, you know, they're having county, uh, like, what are they called? Like pop-up shops, but that's not what they call them. They're like, like little vaccine clinics that pop up and they're in one county one day and one county the next day. So uh, in Josephine County this week, they had this vaccine clinic and they had a couple of vac vaccinators. Is that a word? It's like pollinators you know, healthcare workers who were giving the vaccine. And they went out to this really remote location and they were on their way back to the vaccine clinic to give out more vaccines. And there was a snowstorm and a traffic jam and a jackknife trailer and um, traffic was stopped and they realized they were not getting back anytime soon. Snow was coming down and then they realized that their vaccine that had already been defrosted was gonna expire before they could get back to give those doses out. So what did they do? They got out of their cars and they just started knocking on the windows of the cars in front of them saying, we have this vaccine, it's gonna expire. Can we give you a shot? Woof, goosebumps again. And so their quick thinking meant that that vaccine was not wasted and some people got to be vaccinated. What's mine is yours and what's yours is mine. Those healthcare workers realized that that vaccine belonged to the people and they had to get it to the people for the good of those people, but for the good of the whole community. It was their responsibility to get that vaccine into arms where it could do good. And they gave, and they gave. And wasn't that story a blessing? A blessing to the people who received it, a blessing to the people who gave it, and a blessing to all of us to see People are working together for the good of all of us. We do have an abundance. And it's so hard to remember that when we see so much scarcity around us, when we feel that scarcity in our spirit, when we feel that scarcity and it's just driving us into that COVID wall, we can't keep doing this, right? In community, we remember that in God's reality, there actually is an abundance. We do have an abundance, but we can only live out that abundance in community. We have to give to one another. We have to receive from one another to realize the abundance God has given us. It's like God has given us this abundance, but it's only real and tangible when we share with one another. If we keep it all for ourselves, um, we miss out. The abundance doesn't become real. That's what creates shortages. When we give of ourselves, then we're able to live out God's abundance. That's kind of like the macro level of thinking about how, how we support one another with our gifts. But if you bring it down to the micro level, we can see that when we give of one another, uh, give of ourselves to one another in our congregation, it's that same blessing that we get when we pray for one another. We're invested in each other. We, we're invested in our congregation. We're invested in our community. We're invested in being a source of hope for not just the people who come to this building or who come to our Zoom calls, but we're a source of hope for everyone in our community. And the gifts that we give make it possible for us to be here when there is a crisis. I can't tell you how many times as the pastor I am grateful that I am a full-time pastor. I don't take that for granted. There are plenty of churches and ministries where the, the pastor, the leader, has to be a tent maker. That's, that's a, a Paul term because Paul was a tent maker. He, he and his uh, community made and sold tents so they would have enough money to live on so they could do this ministry. There are plenty of pastors who are tent makers who have to have a source of income and then they can kind of lead a church on the side. I'll tell you when I'm most grateful that I'm a full-time pastor is when there is a crisis in, in the community or in our congregation and someone calls me and says, can you please talk? Because I have a problem. This happens and I can't share these stories because they're confidential. I have to keep, I have to honor these stories and the people who tell them to me. So you just kind of have to take my word for it. I'm sorry, I wish I could share these stories because they would touch you. But, um, 
but that is what your gifts do. They allow me to be present so that when there's a crisis, our church is ready to respond, to, to be a source of a good word of hope and encouragement and new life and help people get through those times of crisis. You might think hearing this that I'm talking just about you, but I'm not. There's so many people have, have come to me. People who are not even related to our church have called and I'm, I'm able to be there for them. And so you might not even be aware of the good that your gifts do. Isn't that the, the uh, quote from Henry Nowen that we started with? You might not even see the fruitfulness of your gifts, but I see them and I'm so grateful for them that uh, through, through my work, through the work of all of our volunteers, we are here for our community. And there are so many times where we are able to be that, uh, that source of love and hope that they need. So our gifts make God's abundance real for one another and for so many people that you'll never see or know about. But we are a sign of God's abundance in a time of scarcity, in a time of crisis. We are there to show God's love through our gifts to one another. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, we always do our um, celebration of the offering before the sermon, but today I'm doing it after the sermon because I want us to hear the blessing of the offering in light of all that we've just thought about. Uh, and this, again, is one of those things that I've really rethought because of our COVID experience. Offering in our Sunday morning worship used to be a routine, right? Oh, we're so grateful, thank you, we do this, and we, we say the right words of thanks, we sing the lovely song of thanks, and then we move on. I don't take this offering for granted anymore. I'm so deeply grateful for it. And I really see it as a sign of celebrating in community. So now when I thank God on behalf of all of us for the gifts that we've received and the gifts we're able to give, uh, it, I'm moved, I'm, uh, I, I celebrate, I praise, I give thanks because it's very, very real to me right now. So in that light, thanks be to God for all we have received and thanks be to God for all we are able to give. Two, three, four, one.
friends, thank you so much for joining us for this time of worship. Your presence on the other side of the screen makes a difference. It makes a difference to my life. I know it makes a difference to the congregation and it makes a difference to our community and world. Thank you for giving of yourselves through your tithes and offerings, through your time, through your prayers, your presence, and your story. You make a difference in this world in the name of God. Thanks be to God. Let's receive our benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, now and forevermore. Amen. Come, Spirit, come, our hearts control. Our spirits long to be made whole. Let it where love guide every being. By this we worship and are free.